Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We start another paper which uh, I have just uh, completed the first three questions and in this paper we're going to discuss the question four, five and six. Starting with question number four, Berlinka is a variety of common grape wine, Vitis linifera. Berlinka grapes are used for making wine and sold as fruit. There are economic and ecological benefits from using less water to irrigate grape wine plants while still producing a high crop yield. Now, it's a very typical biological English. The rate of flow of sap within the xylem vessels from roots to leaves can be used as an estimate of the rate of transpiration. Please remember, rate of transpiration is not in your syllabus anymore. This also indicates water uptake. I'm discussing this question because of certain parts which are still relevant. The others I won't discuss. The hydrogen bonding of water molecules is important in the transport of sap within xylem. State the term used to describe water molecules sticking together within the xylem vessel cohesion, water molecules sticking to the cellulose adhesion. Then coming to the B part of the question, experiment was carried out to investigate the effect of leaf area on the rate of flow of the xylem sap during fruit development. Now this is a bit out of uh, syllabus, but I want to discuss it because xerophytic leaves are still in your syllabus, so we need to be talking about that. So that's why I'm discussing this question, but it is it's slightly irrelevant to the present day syllabus. The flow rate was measured over a three day period. Uh, plants were growing in the same condition. Now, reading graphs, remember how you read graphs. There's something I want to teach you all. So leaf area of grapevine A. So when you look at A, A would be this one, right? Then uh, B would be this one. So B is somewhere this, and then you look at the graph and you very carefully, I mean, of course I'm giving it different colors. So look at it very carefully. And then of course you come up with the, so this would be C, and this would be the B one. So please understand that C would be in the, the three colors that I've used. So you can see they are sort of, as we say in the A2 syllabus, they're same peaks and troughs. Same peaks and troughs, and this is day one, and this is day two, and day three. So it's probably during the day and night story, which you have to understand. Of course, that is very relevant to the present syllabus. And now, as we read the part one of the question, the general pattern of results in figure 4.1 is the same for the three Berlinka grapevines. Explain why the general pattern of results is the same. So explain means you'll have to give me some biology. And then it says for part two, uh, with reference to figure 4.1, explain the differences. So general pattern first, and then explain the difference. That's very typical questions which come in your A-level, AS-level biology, in the results between the three grapevines, one, two, and three. Now let's go through the mark scheme. As you can see from the mark scheme, higher rate of transpiration during the day, or if you said lower rate of transpiration during the night, then the fact that stomata are open during the day, then uh, the idea that all the three wines were kept in the same condition, so a change condition that affects transpiration will affect all the three. Then the fact that during the daylight stomata are open to obtain carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. So that was four points, but you only have to give me two of these. Then for the part two of the question, I mean, how, uh, why the, the different, why, why it was all the, the greater the reef area, uh, the higher the rate of transpiration naturally. Uh, the greater the total area of the leaf, the more stomata are present. Then detail of any one of the grapevine, the grapevine one highest uh, transpiration rate and highest number of the stomata or grape three lowest transpiration and lowest number of stomata. Then relationship between the total internal surface area and the leaf area. Large surface leaf surface area means internal surface area increased. Then relationship between internal and rates of evaporation. So more the surface area, more the rate of evaporation and then the last is higher the rate of flow of xylem sap for largest leaf area, more water used in meta metabolism, more leaves, so more xylem vessel. So you all have to understand this, but this is now going to come to you in more in the context of zero phytic leaves. So remember, this question would be slightly different if it came this year. Uh, then coming to part three of the question, suggest an explanation for the decrease in flow rate of xylem shown at time P in figure 4.1. You can see here at P, there is a lower rate of transpiration at uh, P. So they're asking you, what could that be? Now, the very simple answer to that, uh, the reason it could be overcast, it could be cloudy, there could be rain, there could be some sort of a shade, or there is lesser wind speed, or there is a higher humidity. Because if it's higher humidity, naturally the rate of transpiration would decrease. 
But if somebody said um, stomata close, well, that's wrong because there's still some transpiration going on. So that would be a reject. And I think a large number of students wrote that. So stomata close would be wrong because still transpiration is occurring at this point. If you see at this point, transpiration is still occurring. Flow rate is around about this point here. So please understand that you can't be writing such stuff uh, which will be irrelevant. Then it says outline how you would determine the surface area of one side of a leaf. Now this of course being removed from the syllabus, so we don't want to talk about it anymore. Uh, question five: uh, The causative organism of measles is morbidly virus. Uh, morbidly virus. Young children who have not been vaccinated for measles are all highest risk of becoming ill and developing complications. Please remember, measles is no longer in your syllabus. So, but we will just talk about it for certain reasons. The genetic material of morbidly is a strand of RNA. Was RNA DNA is in your syllabus? That's why I'm talking about this. Such statements A, B, and C relate to the structure of RNA. State the correct term or terms to match each of the situations A to C. So purines, purines, as you remember, is A U G. That's how I make you all remember it. Uh, purines. So purines are adenine and guanine. So purine, adenine, and guanine, 14th August, Pakistan was made. It was 14th of August, so just remembering that. And uh, pyrimidines are cytosine and uracil. Please remember we're talking of the RNA. And a large number of students would have written cytosine and thymine because they are careful, they're careless. They just don't want to remember. They're talking about the DNA or the RNA. So cytosine and uracil. Right. In any order, you could have written uracil first in cytosine and the type of covalent bond between RNA and nucleotides. Naturally, there's only one bond, which is called the phosphodiester bond. Now, this is something which is rote learning. You have to just remember it. There's nothing of any understanding, but you just have to remember it. Phosphodiester bond and the pento sugar is ribose, not deoxyribose. RNA is ribose. DNA is deoxyribose. Then describe how measles is transmitted. That's out of the syllabus now. Then this whole thing about, yes, uh, young children with measles may develop difficulties with breathing. This is made worse if the child is continuously exposed to tobacco smoke. Tobacco smoke contains harmful uh, compounds. Inhaled tobacco passes through the larynx and other structures. Complete the list. Of course, tobacco smoke and all that is out of the syllabus but because larynx and all this in the syllabus, so I'm talking about this. Uh, as you can see, the, they've asked you uh, correct sequence of the main structures of the gas exchange. Of course, that wood is in the syllabus, so it will be tronchia, trachea, bronchus, and bronchiole. And all this uh, would only be one mark. So it's not something that you shouldn't have known, it's more AO levels. Then state that now the carbon monoxide, not in the syllabus anymore. Then as we go ahead, this is also not in the syllabus. This is all about smallpox. Smallpox has been removed from the syllabus, so we don't talk about this anymore. Then this uh, leukemia is also out of the clear, suggests the reason for the trend. I've left all that out. Now coming on to the last question, question six, uh, which is of course still in the syllabus, immobilized enzymes. MLAs is an enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolysis of starch into reducing sugars. So starch to maltose, maltose is a reducing sugar. A student carried out an experiment to investigate the hydrolysis of starch using immobilized enzymes. You see, immobilized enzymes is when you have these glass beads and you have actually fixed the enzymes onto it. So they are not loose anymore. They aren't loose anymore like in a, in a solution or anything, but you've got them fixed onto these beads. So immobilized, immobilized and amylase. So this would be the bead and the bead would have the amylase enzyme stuck onto it. Uh, figure 6.1 is a diagram of the apparatus was used in the investigation. You have this is full of the starch solution. So we've got the starch solution and then we've got the tap. And then we've got the immobilized amylase. So you've got these beads inside here. And uh, in alginate beads. And then of course you've got another tap and then your beaker for collecting the product. Now you realize that you put in starch, so the starch would convert to maltose. So this starch would convert to maltose because what you have on the beads is the enzyme amylase. 
So here you should get maltose. But then if some of the starch has not been digested, then you would get starch plus maltose. And then of course you can, what you can do is you can again put this in here and then again pass it through it till you only get maltose and all the starch has been hydrolyzed. So this is something which you need to be considering, thinking of it, thinking you're doing this in the lab. Now you say the alginate beads were all the same size. Both taps were open to allow the star solution to flow down the column and for the products to be, product to be collected. The product was tested for the presence of reducing sugar and starch. Now, sort of imagine it that you're doing this in the lab and you're actually doing it. So then you can think of all the pros and cons which might come with it. Then let's look at the question. The result of the investigation showed that the product collected in the beaker contained reducing sugar, which is the maltose and the starch. So with reference to figure 6.1, describe a method that would allow the student to use the immobilized amylase to collect a product that contains only reducing sugar. Now, if you actually think you're doing it, only then you can think of ideas how to just collect so that there's no starch in it and there's just maltose in it. Now, if you look at the mark scheme, the mark scheme is so very uh, typical. Uh, open the top tab and keep the bottom tab closed. So you got this column and then you've got this coming in and you've got the tab, they've got one tab here and you've got one tab here. So of course, if you open the top tab and you let the star solution flow into it and you close this tab, so the starch is going to stay here for a little longer time. So open the top tab and keep the bottom tab closed or you close the bottom tab for a longer time and open the bottom tab to collect the product. So, of course, you are allowing more time for the enzymes to come in contact with the starch solution. So, the starch solution is passing through it and the more time it's taking for the amylase and the starch to interact, so more of the starch will be hydrolyzed to maltose. So, one suggestion was this. The second suggestion was modification of the experiments. Use smaller beads or use more beads or you could add a whisking tubing attached to the end so that the starch molecules which are large would not pass through the whisking tubing. You can't use a filter paper. Please remember, filter paper would not be blocking it. So it's an ignore reference to filtering with filter paper. Then test a sample of the product with iodine solution. And uh, if it stays orange, does not change blue back, so it means no starch is present. And then, of course, using the optimum temperature for the amylase uh, would be, of course, another mark scheme point. So these were all the points which you could have suggested for making it more uh, so that all the starch is converted to maltose. Now, coming to the B part of the question, it says one standard variable in the investigation is the size of the alginate beads. Suggest one reason why using larger or smaller alginate beads in the column would affect the results obtained. Now, I've explained this point of the syllabus, surface area to volume ratio story. So if you have one centimeter cube, the surface area has got six sides. So surface area one into one into six, so six centimeters square. Volume is one into one into one. L3, so 1 cm cube, while in the 2 cm is 24 uh, is the surface area and uh, volume is 8. So what we, what, we, what we need to understand is that, you know, now the smaller cube had 6 ratio 1, but the larger cube has 3 ratio 1. So look at the point that I've written. Surface area to volume ratio decreases with increasing size. So they've, they've asked you if you use smaller beads or if you use larger beads. So one reason why using smaller beads in the column would affect, yes, because if you have the smaller beads, then their surface area to volume ratio is larger. So surface area to volume ratio is as, as the, in, there's a more surface area to volume ratio of the smaller beads. Then the other point that they've given you is that ratio is different with a consequence like Smaller bead means increased contact of the substrate with the enzyme. Or you could have said larger surface uh, area, larger surface area exposed when you're using smaller beads. So you have lots of smaller beads, so a larger surface area is exposed. While as compared to this, you have large beads, right? And then the larger bead slows rate of diffusion into beads. Or you can say increases the diffusion in, ti in diffusion time to reach the enzyme. And larger beads would also increase the late rate of flow through the column. So imagine the rate of flow is the most important thing which you were talking about. And that, of course, I remember a very old paper had this question again. So the rate of flow has also got to be thought about.
Uh, that finishes paper and thank you very much. And uh, please understand that um, if you find it difficult to go through 15 minutes of, uh, you know, listening to a video, so you must pause in between and have a cup of coffee or uh, have something to eat so that you can concentrate on it. And something which is not clear, please go back and uh, revisit it, revisit it and see that you've understood it. Uh, and I hope you have the papers in front of you and the mark schemes in front of you so that you do a good job of it in uh, comprehending these questions. And thank you once again.